This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non commercial use only. Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. Tonight at 8 o'clock, the sirens will blare across the country, marking the beginning of Holocaust and Martyrs Remembrance Day. President Shimon Peres and Prime Minister Ehud Olmert will attend the state ceremony at Yad Vashem in Jerusalem. Tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, the sirens will sound again, and the country will come to a standstill in memory of the victims. Meanwhile, thousands of youngsters from Israel and around the world have gathered near the Auschwitz-Birkenau Nazi death camps in Poland for the annual March of the Living. This year, for the first time, the IDF Chief of Staff, Lieutenant General Gabi Ashkenazi, accompanied by senior IDF officers and cadets, will lead the march. Yesterday, General Ashkenazi visited the site of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising and saluted the courage and heroism of the Jews who defied the crushing might of the German army. During Auschwitz earlier today, General Ashkenazi said, I have come here to tell the world, never again. Meanwhile, a complete closure has been imposed on the territories starting tonight and ending after the Independence Day celebrations. Palestinians will only be allowed to cross into Israel for humanitarian reasons. While the country commemorates the victims of the Nazi Holocaust each year, it has only recently, and much too late, begun to pay attention to the plight of the survivors, especially those here in Israel, most of them, of course, elderly, and many in poor health and dire economic straits. In recent months, the monthly income of survivors has almost doubled as the government finally increased monthly stipends. At the same time, retired High Court Justice Dahlia Dorner, who heads the Commission of Inquiry probing the government's treatment of Holocaust survivors, has not yet published her findings. However, Dorner did say today that due to inflation over the years, survivors living in Israel receive only about one-third of the amount paid by Germany to survivors living outside of Israel. Well, the word out of Cairo today is that the Palestinian terror factions meeting in the Egyptian capital have agreed to a ceasefire with Israel, but here at home, security officials are bracing for more Palestinian violence. IBA's Leah Stern report, reports. Shabak GSS Chief Yuval Diskin and Head of Army Intelligence Major General Amos Yadlin warned that Hamas is planning a major terror attack for Independence Day and intends on targeting IDF troops on the Gaza border and kidnapping Israeli soldiers. Meanwhile, Palestinian terrorists continued their rocket barrage on Israel today, firing Qassam rockets and mortar shells at the western Negev from the northern Gaza Strip. One of them struck next to a school in Sterot. Defense Minister Ehud Barak said today that his gut instinct is to respond immediately and with full force to the ongoing rocket attacks in Gaza. However, Barak said we must act with due caution and at the right time. Barak was speaking to reporters after observing army maneuvers on the Golan Heights. The defense minister said, quote, our hearts are in the south with the Israelis who live near the border with Gaza. According to Egyptian officials, intelligence chief Omar Suleiman today managed to win the consent of the Palestinian terror groups to a ceasefire with Israel. Hamas leaders gave their approval last week for a truce that would begin in Gaza and then extend to the West Bank. Today, internal security minister Avi Dichter urged the government not to go along with a ceasefire, which he said would be exploited by the terror groups to smuggle even more weapons and explosives into Gaza. Dichter was speaking at a security cabinet meeting called today to discuss the situation in Gaza. A majority of the ministers at the meeting also voiced their opposition to a ceasefire. Prime Minister Ehud Olmert did not give his opinion, saying he was waiting until the security establishment finalizes its position on the ceasefire issue. Yesterday, Sterot Mayor Eli Moyal met with Prime Minister Ehud Olmert and said afterwards that the Prime Minister had given him the distinct impression that he is on the verge of making a dramatic decision on the situation in Gaza. This is Leah Stern for IBA News.
In a ministerial meeting for the Israeli government, the vast majority of cabinet members have opposed the cooling of period with the Palestinians. They said that the proposed cooling of period was an attempt by Hamas to buy more time in order to further arm itself. However, the Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Olmert declined to voice his position before hearing first the opinion of his defense minister Ehud Barak. Amidst this, the U.S. Secretary of State, Condoleezza Rice, said that there's a great possibility for the creation of a Palestinian state before President Bush leaves office. The U.S. President George W. Bush expressed optimism for reaching an agreement before the end of his term. Bush said that the release of the details regarding the Israeli raid on what he referred to as the Syrian nuclear reactor was to send a message to Iran, Syria and North Korea. A strange optimism comes from the U.S. administration over what can be achieved in eight months that the past 18 years of negotiations have failed to accomplish. I believe that we have a chance now. I believe that we have a chance to reach an agreement during this year for the creation of a peaceful Palestinian state based on the roadmap for peace. My confidence is not based on blind or ridiculous optimism, but it comes from a firm belief that we have the right resolution to end the conflict. The extremists can no longer destroy peace opportunities. The choice is clear. You either become a political party or a terrorist group. Rice didn't clarify the details of her revelation. The U.S. applause for the agreement was limited to a specific issue, which has to do with the creation of a Palestinian state. The U.S. revelation failed to mention the Israeli violations of the roadmap for peace, including the growing settlements, which witnessed an unprecedented increase since the Annapolis conference. Instead, the U.S. Secretary of State accused Hamas of hampering the peace efforts. Rice added that Hamas is fighting on behalf of Iran and those evolving in its sphere, including the Palestinian resistance factions, which met in Cairo to study an Egyptian-sponsored initiative aimed at reaching a cooling-off period with Israel. In brief, Rife said that there is a radical belt extending from Hamas to Hezbollah in Lebanon and from Iraq to Afghanistan, supported primarily by Iran and to a lesser degree by Syria. This belt is shaking the security and the stability of the region. Rice didn't oppose a peace deal between Israel and Syria if they agreed to it. It seems that Rice's position has intersected with earlier announcements that were made by the Israeli Deputy Prime Minister Shaul Mufaz, who met Rice in Washington. Mufaz talked about a radical alliance led by Iran, and such alliance is gaining momentum and must be weakened. He also rejected the return of Golan to Syria to stop Iran from moving in, enabling Tehran to overlook the entire area of Galilee. It is a U.S. wish to achieve a political agreement bypassing what is referred to as extremists and those supporting them. However, those whom Rice referred to as extremists are on the ground and they must be included if a consensus is to be reached. The U.S. administration does not know how to deal with them as it continues to refuse negotiating with them. One U.S. idea to deal with them is by sending them messages of shelling, which President George Bush said that the raid on Syria was a model for. The Secretary General of the Arab League, Amar Musa, warned about the danger of the Israeli nuclear arsenal and called for making the region free from nuclear weapons. The non-alignment movement countries at the Geneva meeting are calling on the international community to pressure Israel to sign the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty especially since Israel possesses more than 200 nuclear missile warheads. Nearly 40 decades ago, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty was approved to protect the world from the danger of these weapons, which threaten the human destiny. Most of these countries signed on to this treaty, including Arab countries, except for Israel, the only country which refuses to sign or even consider debating it. It is backed by American and European collaboration under justifications that no one believes. In the meeting being held in Geneva to discuss the issue of nuclear proliferation, the non-alignment movement called for taking practical and active measures to push countries, which have not signed this treaty, like Israel, to become a party to it. 
They criticized the double standard policy and the refusal by large nuclear countries to commit to a standard policy for nuclear disarmament, as well as the lack of demands on Israel to place all its nuclear facilities under the monitors of the International Atomic Energy Agency. If the United States and some of its allies were really concerned about the security and the peace of the world, then it would not take them too much time or effort to reach the massive Israeli nuclear weapons arsenal, which is not internationally monitored. Under the watch and support of the international community, Israel possesses more than 200 nuclear warheads and many other unconventional weapons. We do not see the United States and their European allies deal with this file in the same way they have dealt with Iraq, Iran and Korea. If they do not know what is going on in Dimona and what is being produced there, then the IAEA can tell them because it knows the Dimona catastrophe very well. Welcome to Eye on Israel program. It's trickery and betrayal, nothing else. This is how one can describe the Israeli spying operation inside the U.S., which was uncovered recently. It's true that this is not surprising considering that Israel is tricky even with its close allies. But how can one explain the fact that Israel will do such a thing to the country that supports it financially and protects its existence? As the saying goes, if you have no shame, do whatever you want. The following report was originally aired on Israeli Channel 1. This is not the first time the media brings up the issue of Jonathan Pollard. When Pollard tried to enter the Israeli embassy in Washington, he was expelled and arrested. On that day, other Israelis left the United States, including Avi M. Salah, Yossi Yagor, the scientific attaché and Pollard's handler, and Ben Ami Kadish. The details of the operation are as such. Pollard brought the documents to a secret apartment where they were copied and sent to Israel. Yossi Yagor focused on technological information, and Kadish focused on nuclear information, F-16 planes, and the Patriot missile system. The spies were Jewish Americans who loved Israel. Contrary to the rules of spying, the two were handled by the same agent. My husband did not know anything about this man Kadish or about this subject. He has no links to this matter. This can only cause harm. The years in which Pollard and Kadish were operating overlapped. In the first eight years, the spy network was headed by Rafi Etam. The ministers of defense were Sharon, Arons and Rabin. The prime ministers were Begin, Shamir and Peretz. Why was this case raised at this time? I do not know. It happened about 20 years ago. At the time, Israel, which was embarrassed, swore that he was operating alone. The Israeli government gave away Jonathan Pollard and handed him over, thereby sentencing him. It became clear that both Pollard and Kadish were working at the same time. It is true that his spying activities were stopped when Pollard was arrested. However, he stayed with his handler who ordered him to lie in the investigation. The Americans do not like that. And most importantly, Israel swore that Pollard was operating alone, and then a second spy was uncovered. So can one expect a third spy or even more? The question is, when will the FBI knock on other doors? A 
أفاد مراسل العربية في اليمن أن قذيفتين استهدفتا صباح اليوم حيا سكنيا. The Al Arabiya reporter in Yemen said that two missiles had struck a residential complex where the Italian embassy is located in the Yemeni capital of Sana'a. There were no reported injuries. The security forces said that unknown attackers launched two missiles on the parking lot of the customs building near the Italian embassy. They added that an investigation is ongoing. This is the second attack of its kind. Previously, missiles hit a building that was inhabited by Americans, but there were also no injuries at that time. The missile attack against the government building near the Italian embassy in Sana'a raised questions about the increase of attacks on foreign embassies and interests since the beginning of 2008. There were different explanations of what happened. Yemeni officials reiterated that two missiles landed on the customs building. News agencies, however, reported different versions of the story. Some said that explosive devices were used in the incident, but others Others said that it was a missile attack. The increase of violence and attacks on foreign interests raised questions about the possible identities of the perpetrators who carry such acts despite the high state of security alert in Sana'a and other Yemeni cities. The consecutive acts of violence mainly targeted tourists, embassies, and Western interests. On the 18th of January, a tourist convoy was attacked in Hadramut, in which two Belgian tourists were killed. On the 18th of March, the American embassy was attacked by missiles, which missed their aim, hitting a nearby school. On the 7th of April, three explosions targeted a residential complex inhabited by American diplomats in Sana'a, but there were no injuries. There are speculations that Al-Qaeda is responsible for the acts of violence in Yemen. Several months ago, Al-Qaeda threatened to avenge the imprisonment of its members in Yemeni jails. Al-Qaeda also declared its responsibility for the attacks that targeted the Americans in Sana'a. Political observers attribute the acts of violence to the fact that Al-Qaeda has managed to capitalize on the spread of weapons in the country and to the fact that the government is preoccupied with the crisis of Al-Houthi and his followers, as well as the state of resentment in the southern states. These factors have weakened the government's ability to deal with security problems, especially when considering that the relations between the U.S. and Yemen have become tense over the war on terror. Moving to Iraq now, where the Prime Minister has threatened an all-out military assault against Muqtadar al-Sadr's Mehdi army. Nouri al-Maliki says the militia must lay down its arms and stop interfering in state affairs. In the aftermath of recent attacks, a series of funerals have been held in Baghdad's Sadr city on Wednesday morning. There's been heavy fighting also between U.S. forces and predominantly Shia gunmen. Dozens of people have died. Well, Owen Bay reports now from the Iraqi capital. The battle for Sadr city is intensifying by the day, and the proof is measured in bodies. Local hospitals are being overwhelmed by the daily procession of dead and wounded carried through their doors. One local boy was reportedly wounded by a bullet piercing his school bag. The attacks are the direct result of a renewed effort by the Iraqi military and their American counterparts to stop attacks being launched by the Mehdi army from within Sadr city. Representatives of Muqtada al-Sadr say the emphasis within their ranks has shifted. They've backed away from a threat to lift a ceasefire and are instead renewing efforts to engage the U.S. military. In his statement, Muqtada al-Sadr's declaration of open war was not on the Iraqi people but on the occupation forces. He also called on Iraqi military and police forces to support Mahdi army in fighting against U.S. occupation. Civilians in this sprawling Baghdad neighborhood continue to be caught in the crossfire. Women and children among the victims of a gradual intensification of fighting between American and Iraqi forces on one hand and members of the Mehdi army on the other. According to the American military, over the past three days of fighting, nearly 80 militants have been killed. Local residents, however, believe they are being targeted. Isn't their conscience shaken for this city, which has been in siege for more than a month? What have they done? What have they committed? Are they afraid for their chairs? And that's why we're not calling for justice. 
For its part, the Iraqi government says the crackdown against militias announced on March 25th will continue for as long as it takes until those groups lay down their weapons. They should hand in their weapons and cease to use them against the government security forces or civilians. And if they don't, then we will continue to target them. One of the reasons for the recent intensification has been the weather. Over the past week, a series of sandstorms have blown across the Iraqi capital. When that happens, American drones and helicopters are grounded, and the Methi army can launch mortar and rocket attacks at will. That results in a change of tactics and an increase in street-by-street -street fighting. And as a result, it's the civilians who pay the deadliest price. Owen Fay, Al Jazeera, Baghdad. Well, to discuss this further, I'm joined now by Owen in Baghdad. Uh, Owen, uh, let's just talk about the numbers of deaths. We're talking about hundreds of people, hundreds of Iraqis have died in this last month. It's been a bloody month for Iraqis. Can you just shed some light on where they've been killed? It's not just the capital, is it? Uh, that's right, Sohail. It's been right across the country, predominantly in the capital, but also in the south, in Basra, and to a certain extent in Kut. Now, we have just spoken to police sources who have given us the official Interior Ministry numbers for this month, specifically within Sadr City alone. They say that 321 people have been killed, 832 people have been injured. That's an average of just over 10 people a day, and that is just within the confines of Sadr City itself. In the broader context, looking at the country at a whole, those numbers shoot up even more, quite dramatically, and the numbers vary. But it is many hundreds of people, and it does show quite an intensification of the fighting. It illustrates, on the one hand, that the Mehdi army is very serious now about retaliating against any attacks by the Americans or by the Iraqi military. And it also shows that the Iraqi military, backed by the American military support, are going into these areas. They are taking the fight. They are calling in airstrikes. They are not back off and it looks as if this is only ratcheting up more and more so well of course uh, this dialogue that's uh, coming out of the the Prime Minister's office of all-out war or an offensive against uh, Muqtadar al Sadr it could lead to the ceasefire that's been called by uh, Sadr being jeopardized surely it certainly could lead to it being jeopardized because what the Prime Minister is doing right now is leaving no room for compromise. This is more or less what he's been saying over the past month, but what's notable about these latest statements is the tone. He's not giving any leeway whatsoever. He's not saying there needs to be uh, a general amnesty, in which case various groups can rejoin the political process. He's not giving any room whatsoever. What he's saying is that all of these groups, he singled out the Mehdi army, but he's also talked about other militant groups, must obey all all the conditions being laid down by the government immediately or they will be wiped out. There's absolutely nothing that's unclear about these statements and therefore, given that the Mehdi army has backed away from its call to lift its ceasefire, but it has said it wants to put all its efforts into fighting the, the occupiers as it refers to the Americans and to a certain degree the Iraqi army, it means that this standoff is likely to continue and if it gets pushed much further, Muqtada might just decide to lift his ceasefire. It's a very tenuous situation at the moment. Well, we know that you'll be following events for us there. Owen Owen Fay, our correspondent there in Baghdad. Thank you. The invasion of Afghanistan did not ease the suffering of women there. Ordinary Afghan women are forced to do unordinary things. This statement was used by UNICEF to describe the situation of women in Afghanistan. Without a doubt, women face difficult living conditions due to the difficult geographic, climate and political conditions in this unstable country. The following report by Fiza Alak provides a closer look at the lives of Afghan women. A father and his six children mourn the death of the mother who died while giving birth to the seventh child. It is not surprising to see this man praying alone for his wife in this village which is called Dar el Janeh in the remote region of Fizbad in northern Afghanistan. One out of every nine women die while giving birth or soon after it. My sister died while giving birth. There is no one to care for her orphaned children. She died because there is no medical facility nearby. 
The roads here are very difficult. Without a doubt, the difficult roads and living conditions can have tragic consequences to pregnant women. This explains why UNICEF considers Afghanistan the most dangerous place on earth for women. Here, 40 percent of women marry before they become 18 years old. One third of them give birth before they become adults. Many of the pregnant women do not get medical care. Only 11 percent of childbirth takes place in hospitals. Women's mortality rate in our region is very high, especially in remote and mountainous areas. My mother also died while giving birth. This made me decide to study medicine because I wanted to help save women's lives. The catastrophe of this woman and others like her, as well as the decision of the Afghan government to open medical care facilities for women in remote areas, have created health awareness among the Afghan women. It has also given women the determination to fight to save lives during childbirth. The water supply project in the city of Niala is among the developmental projects being launched by the Sudanese National Unity Government and the government of southern Darfur. The project has reached a considerable phase of implementation and is expected to be completed by next year. The project, which entails the supplying of water from the Bikala Reservoir to the Sudanese city of Niala, is caught between a dream and reality. It is a long tale of suffering that goes back to 1968 when the project was in its planning stage. On March 4, 2004, the Sudanese government signed a deal with the Republic of China to fund the project. The actual implementation of the project started on February 18, 2008, after work preparations were completed completed and after all equipment, machineries and building materials arrived in Sudan. We were able to convince the Chinese to make changes to the original design. We have extended six water supply networks to the countryside between the area of Karada and Nyala. These networks will help supply sufficient water for the residents, the farmers and the local herders. I think that this project is what the residents need. You cannot have water underground and leave the people here thirsty. This area in particular is known for farming. Many farmers grow grains, crops and other agricultural products. The project includes the excavation of 20 artesian wells, the building of a plant to collect water, a control room, and a water pipeline. In addition, the project includes three distribution stations between the areas of Gireda and Niala. The main water reservoir at the top of the Niala mountain will feed into ground plants that distribute to the network. The project will supply nearly 40,000 cubic meters of fresh water each day. The total cost of the project is estimated at $50 million and is being administered by a special Chinese company. This project, which supplies water from the Bikala Reservoir to the area of Niala, is among the largest development projects benefiting the people of Darfur. The project will cost more than $50 million. We are anxiously waiting for the completion of this project, which will help meet the need of the city. The Niala Water Project is one of the most important national strategic projects aimed at resolving water problems in the city and surrounding countryside areas. Get more news about the Middle East online at linktv.org slash mosaic. The Mosaic webpage offers a complete archive of Mosaic programs, program transcripts, the Mosaic video podcast, and the Mosaic intelligence report, a weekly analysis of the hottest stories from the Middle East. The views expressed on Mosaic are those of the participating broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. 
production of Mosaic is made possible with the support of viewers like you. Thank you. This program was brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. television network devoted to global and national news with uncompromising documentaries and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.